I am a part of a group of friends. It's the Lead Pastors Fellowship of Auburn. And this is a very, very diverse group of people. I, I value this group so much that even through the busy, busy days that we've had over these past six months, I still have gone and made it a priority to, to have lunch with them once a month. And these, these, uh, these people, they are, it, it, like I say, it's, it's a wide variety of people. We've got one guy, he's got a shaved head, and he's a super manly man. He's like a take-no-prisoners kind of pastor. Like, he does not mince words, man. He gets in there and gets her done. Then we've got another guy that's just super quiet and understated. We have a, a, another guy that's really, uh, things are just, it's been really interesting what's been happening for him. He is right here from Auburn. He is out there on national talk shows right now. He was on Tamron Hall last week uh, in New York, and he, he's just written a book, and he's just getting a lot of, of, uh, of press, and he's on news shows, and just uh, lots of things going on with him. We, we have uh, some people in this group that were born in other countries. So for them, English is a second language. And so all the challenges that they have uh, communicating to, to the congregation that primarily uh, speaks English. Then we have one female lead pastor that, that is a part of the group. And it, it's always funny uh, just to see how she interacts with, with the rest of the group and how, how they interact with her. Uh, we have people that are in this group that are Baptist, people that are non-denominational. People that are Assemblies of God, of course, people that are Nazarene, uh, people that are Church of God. It's a great, great group, but it's a very diverse, lots of difference in the group. And yet, somehow, we just love and care for each other. And I I've been here in Auburn now for about 13 and a half years, and someone invited me uh, to, that, to that group. Uh, the, the, my first year, so years ago, and I've been a part of it ever since. It, it, it is so cool to be a part of something like this, where we've we've seen each other go through difficult times, through through victories, uh, through um, uh, devastating things that happen in, in various churches. It, it, it's it's a, a diverse fellowship, but we don't focus on our differences. We are a bunch of difference, ending with T. We're a bunch of different, but we don't focus on our differences. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today from God's Word. So if you have a Bible or you have the Bible on your device, would you turn to Colossians 3, verses 10 to 14. And if, you're, if you've got a phone on, on your device, you can choose which translation most likely. So we read from the NLT typically. So we're, while you're looking for that, we're in a series called Renew. You have been raised to new life with Christ. And our vision as a church is to see every person, that, including you, 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 every person, find real, uh, real hope and renewed life in Jesus. Our vision is that everyone in our community surrounding us and that everyone around the world would find a real hope and renewed life in Jesus. So we're talking about renewed life in this series. And we've discovered over these past few weeks that this is a lifelong process of having your life renewed in Jesus. It's not just one time where you say a prayer and you're done. There is this lifelong process where the Holy Spirit is working in your life and he's showing you things that need to change or need to uh, move forward or he wants to bless you in. And it's a, it is a renewal of your identity in Christ, a renewal of eternal life that God has put inside of you. It's a pretty amazing thing, but it is a lifelong thing. It is a lifelong process. God does his part and we do our part. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Put on your new nature. Somebody say, put on. That's right. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Someone say, like him. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Verse 11. In this new life, this renewed life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. Gentile just means a non-Jew. 
doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised, which refers to um, religious ceremony, and it, it refers to uh, more than just that simple um, surgical procedure. Barbaric, that just simply means someone who's an outsider. Uh, so in this day, it would be someone who's not a Roman or Greek, was a bar- bar- barbarian. Uh, and then uncivilized is how this uh, translation uh, uh, translates this next word, but the original word, the root word is Scythian, S-C-Y, Scythian. And the Scythians were uh, these savage, nomadic warriors uh, of days gone by. And so Paul, is, as he's writing this to us, he, he just sets up all these contrasts. And I'm going to read that verse again in verse 11. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Somebody say, Christ is all. Yeah. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So it really doesn't matter your labels. What matters is who's inside of you, Jesus Christ, if you've asked him into your life. I want to read that same verse, verse 11. It's an important one in the message. The message is a paraphrase. It is not a strict translation, but it's trying to give us the sense of this verse. Colossians 3.11 in the message says, Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free, these words mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. Jesus came to start a revolution. Uh, we were uh, in our, our uh, Hope and Life groups this season. We've been going through the Chosen uh, series about Jesus and his disciples, uh, uh, season two this year. And I love this. In one of the episodes is last week, I believe, Jesus said, I came to start a revolution, not a revolt. A revolution, a movement of people from all walks of life all nationalities, all political leanings, yes, even those from the other side of the aisle as you are welcome and invited to be in the kingdom of God. And it's, it's been really interesting to me uh, knowing where this series was going and then, then seeing last week's episode of The Chosen was just, it, I was like, wow, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the, it is, the Chosen is a drama, so they've taken the Bible and they've just made a, made a play out of it, made a, made a drama. But in that drama, we see the disciples of Jesus fighting all the time. They are always disagreeing all the time. And we can see the, the reason why is because who Jesus called, he called a diverse group of people. So he, he called uh, someone that had been a tax collector, ta- collecting taxes for Rome, who was oppressing Israel. And he also called a, a zealot, a, a Jewish national, nationalist who just wanted to secretly kill every person that was in authority in, in the Roman Empire. And you, those two, just those two guys, just total opposites. But Jesus called the bold the arrogant. He called the meek and the quiet. He called those who seemed to have it all together. He, seemed, he called those who had a, a horrible past. And he called all those people together intentionally because God likes the difference with a T. God likes the difference. And so I want you to know you are invited and you are welcomed to be part of the loving fellowship of difference. Are you different? I'm different for sure. That's, there's no question there. And I know some of you, some of you are different too. Actually, we're all different, right? We're all different. Status and labels don't matter. I, I just finished reading a, uh, a novel by a, uh, a Hebrew scholar and he, he wrote this, this novel about 
um, the, uh, uh, about the life and times of what it would have been like in that first century when all this was going on, that the church was, was being born and Jesus uh, gave his life and rose again. And it was really interesting. It was a well-researched novel. It's, it's, it's pretty... Um, it is a novel to teach us about that time. And the thing that really struck me is the high, high value that the Roman Empire placed on honor. Honor was a super big deal. And so people would be, uh, would be uh, clawing and scraping for honor and position. Uh, uh, in, this, in this novel, there's this one guy, and he called himself, I am the benefactor of cities. And so he would just go around and, like, um, create and pay for statues to be commissioned, like of the Roman emperor and different things like that, in, in order to gain honor and status. It was a very status-driven um, time, a, a culture. But also in the Jewish culture, culture, honor was a super big deal also. So we see the scribes and Pharisees dressing a certain way, uh, praying ostentatiously so others will honor them and revere them. But Paul says, hey, time out. In the kingdom of God, this movement, this revolution that Jesus has started, it's not about whether you are this or you're that. None of that matters. It doesn't matter if you're slave or free. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, male or female. It doesn't matter. What matters in the kingdom of God is that you have put your faith in Jesus and he lives inside you. Christ is all that matters. That's a big statement. Jesus Christ is all that matters when it comes to your identity, when it comes to who you are, your purpose, your mission in life. Christ is all that matters. And actually, that's pretty good news. Because in the churches that Paul was writing to, they were very diverse. He gave that list because uh, uh, slave or free, rich or poor, circumcised, uncircumcised. He gave that list because that's who was in those churches. And he was saying, none of that matters. It was a very diverse group. Now, in the, in the church, if you are a high-status person, maybe you, you have a lot of Instagram followers, or maybe you have a lot of money, or a lot of properties, or maybe you hold a, a public office, but you're, you're a member of the church, this is a place where you don't have to keep up your image. You don't have to strive to outdo everybody else. You can just relax in Jesus Christ and find your identity, your purpose, your meaning in him, the fact that he is in your life. But also, on the flip side, if you are a person and you consider yourself a person of low status, maybe you don't have means, maybe you're barely scraping by, uh, maybe you just uh, feel like you're just sort of a, a, a plain Jane or a plain Joe, and, and you feel like there's nothing special about your life. Well, the good news is you are valued, you are welcomed, you are desired, you are sought after by Jesus Christ for his kingdom. You have great value in the kingdom. And your value is that Jesus Christ is living inside you. Christ is all that matters. And he is living in us. I'm going back to Colossians 3, skipping down to verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Now, I'm going to stop right there before I even go on. We're going to get to a verse in a moment where we're going to be tempted to interpret it singularly, about yourself, individually. But this, these, these verses I'm reading today, they're not written to individuals. They're written to the church, the church at Colossae, a, a city uh, over there in, uh, I believe in Asia Minor, I think would be correct to say that. But uh, Colossae, a, 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 a city over in the Middle East, uh, he's writing, Paul is writing to the church. And so we should see this, we should read these with the church in mind. Since God chose you plural, God chose you all to be the holy people he loves. So God chose you all to be holy. You're chosen. You're chosen by God to be set apart. That's what holy means, to be set apart for him. And you are chosen to be a part of a holy people. Here today in 2023, United States of America, we're pretty individualistic. It, it, it tends to be all about us and the culture around us. 
But that's not how it is in the kingdom of God. It's much more about we than me. God chose you to be the holy people, the church that he loves. I'm going on. You must clothe yourself. There it is again. So last week, I talked about stripping off those, those uh, things in your life that were a part of your past life, those sinful things, those things that led you far away from God, those things that caused uh, relationship issues in your life, those sins. Strip off those sins like a dirty coat at the end of a, of a work day. Strip off those, put to death those things. But today, we're talking about the opposite. So what are you supposed to take on? Clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves. So we take off those ways of flesh and death, and we put on the ways of Jesus and renewed life. So last week, we talked a lot about what you got to get rid of, what we want to get rid of to have renewed life. This week, talking about what you need to, to wear, to wrap yourselves up in. So clothe yourselves with this little list of five things. Clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's a, that's a tall order. And I want to just stop and just, just look at each of those words briefly so we see what they really mean before we go on. That word, tender-hearted mercy, in some translations, it's translated bowels of compassion. The intestines of compassion. And what it means, it's a very picturesque word, but what it, what it means is that uh, he, uh, we're being called to have a, a deep down feeling of mercy and love so deep in your gut that comes from seeing someone's need and prompts you to take action to bring some relief. Tender-hearted mercy, compassion, bowels of compassion. So we are called to actually feel something for those around us in need. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. The second word was kindness. And it's translated different ways by different interpreters just trying to make the most sense of that, that Greek root word. But the root word simply comes from grace. Grace. So clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy and grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited, unearned, unworked for blessing. So we are called to clothe ourselves with the grace that God's given us, with the graciousness that God has dealt with us in, and we're called to pass that on to the others around us. So when you look around our little section of the church, capital C, church worldwide, people following Jesus, but when you look around it, just in our congregation, you're going to see a lot of diversity. You'll see people born in different, uh, different uh, countries. You're going to see people that are male and female. You're going to see people who are, uh, 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 what the world would say is high status, what the world would say is low status. You're going to see all kinds of people around us. And for that reason, because we all come at life a little differently, we need grace. <laughs> we need a lot of grace from God to give to others. It's the kind of grace that compels us to cross over social boundaries. In the church, we actually talk to people we might not normally gravitate towards on the street. But in the church, all that matters is Christ. And Christ lives in us. The third word in that little list was humility. Clothe yourselves with humility. Humility is renouncing your rights and your status in order to serve others. Little dry spot right there. <clears throat> Humility is renouncing your rights and your status in order to serve others. So it's, it's being willing to cross over to help those who, who uh, might seem like they're uh, in a different category than you. That doesn't matter. Like the, the slave to the free, the free to the slave, the insider to the outsider, the religious to the ir irreligious. In the church, in the kingdom of God, we clothe ourselves with humility. But here's, here's a reality. We can become well 
meaning bullies. We we can actually, if we're not careful, impose our desires, our thoughts, our feelings on someone else. It happened to me this weekend. And it's happened to me, happened to me. I'm like, I, I did it to someone else this weekend. It's happened to me many times where someone is well-intentioned. They want the best for me, uh, but they're being pushy. And I, that's how I was this weekend. I was being pushy. And it, Paul reminds us that in the kingdom of God, we need to put on gentleness. Gentleness. And it may not always be something that uh, the manly man think about, uh, putting on gentleness, but all of these five items that Paul says clothe yourself with describe Jesus. So Jesus, the most powerful man who ever lived, was also gentle. He said, I'm gentle and lowly. Come to me, find rest in me. Gentleness is not shouting for your own rights. Gentleness is speaking softly when someone's feeling down or someone's in a low spot. Gentleness is recognizing that there's a time to ask questions rather than make pronouncements. Oh my goodness, if I could just learn that lesson. Gentleness is being careful and thoughtful of the other person. And then finally, uh, Pastor Shelley's favorite of all, patience. She said the Lord has been teaching her patience for decades. Patience is when you find yourself in a difficult situation and you choose to not react in anger or rage. That's patience. Instead, you keep your eye on the bigger picture, on what what God's calling you to do and what God's calling you to be, and you keep your eyes on that. That is being patient. But how does all this work out practically? How do you clothe yourself with those five things? Well, he goes on and describes it very practically. Verse 13, make allowance for... For each other's faults. I say it this way. Cut each other slack. Cut each other some slack. Please, for heaven's sake, literally. It just works in a sermon, doesn't it? Like, it works here in that situation. Make allowance for each other's faults. And that means when, when someone says something that is offensive or hurtful, just, just step back and go, hey, I don't know what they're going through right now. I'm going to cut them some slack because I know we're all in this together. We all love each other. We all love Jesus. But this word, the the root word behind make allowance here is, uh, is a word that also implies that you devotedly care for one another. And one of the ways that you care is by cutting them slack, just allowing someone to have an off day or, or even to say something that they regret. And most likely, the Holy Spirit's going to be working on them, and they're going to come back and apologize for it anyway. But even if he doesn't, we're going to make allowance for each other's faults. He goes on to say, and forgive. Forgive. And this word actually is broader even than just forgive. It literally means show grace to. So in any situation that you can, show grace to others, especially, as he goes on to say, to anyone who offends you. How many are offended by people in the other political party? It doesn't really matter which one <laughs> you're in. <laughs> How many have been offended by something that someone said to you in the last week? How many have been offended by something you saw uh, on, online in the last week? There's so much reason to be offended out there, but what we're actually called to do is forgive or show grace to anyone who offends you. One helpful principle is to not expect someone who is not a follower of Jesus, don't expect them to act like a follower of Jesus. Why would they? And that's, that's one of the reasons we can show them grace because they, they haven't made that, that, um, that life commitment to follow Jesus as yet. And then finally, remember, the Lord forgave you. The Lord gave you great grace So you must forgive and show grace to others. So we're describing a circular grace. God gives it to you, you give it to others, and you receive it from others. That is what it looks like to clothe yourself with these things, with the humility, patience, all of that. And then he goes on and he just wraps it up in verse 14. Above all, 
clothe yourselves with love. That word is is agape. That's a self-sacrificing, giving. Uh, It is a feeling, but it's more than that kind of love. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us or binds these, these characteristics together in perfect harmony. So love... Uh, I read this is a great uh, definition uh, from Scott McKnight. Lo- this love is a durable, covenant-like commitment to others to be with them and for them as you all journey into Christ-likeness. This love that he's saying clothe yourself in is a durable, it's a lasting, it's rugged, covenant-like commitment. So it's, like, it's a covenant-like marriage in the kingdom of God to love each other. And it's that commitment looks like this, being with people. It actually takes time to be with them. And that's one of the reasons why gathering every Sunday is so important. We've got to be with each other in order to love each other. And to show, at least to show that and express it. And also for it, for others. Be an advocate for others as you journey into becoming more and more like Jesus. So the good news is that Jesus is inviting you and me to help him create a loving fellowship of difference with a T. We're a bunch of difference. We're not going to focus on our difference says. It's okay to be different. And we are invited with Jesus to make the church a great place to belong. And I'm not just talking about our congregation, but definitely here too. God intends for you to experience the love you want. Did you hear that? God intends for you to experience the love you want. And he has set up the church as a place where you can find the love you want. It looks like this, tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience wrapped up in love. So why don't we always experience this kind of love in the church? Well, human nature, ashamed people tend to isolate. So if you feel ashamed of yourself or of things you've done, you tend, ashamed people tend to isolate from others and then not experience or give out the love Paul's talking about. Ambitious people tend to alienate others. Because sometimes ambitious people get a little too roughshod and a little bit too much about me, 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 me. And that can be offensive to others. And sometimes ambitious people alienate others. Overwhelmed people tend to withdraw. I'm too overwhelmed. I can't, I I just can't even, can't even. Hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people tend to hurt others. So sometimes then, knowing all this is going on in all of our lives, we don't experience that love of Jesus from him and from each other in the church. So what if, would would you dream with me for a minute? What if you said yes to receiving all the tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience that God has for you? What if you accepted the fact that God loves you? What if you accepted the fact that God is merciful to you? What if you accepted that? How would your life change? What if? What if you actively extended those things, that experience of tender-hearted mercy, love, kindness, humility, to others around you? That would mean actually having a conversation with someone sometime in church and not just being the first one out the door after church. It would mean serving on a team. It would mean uh, praying for someone. Uh, it, It would mean opening up to someone and allowing someone else to open up to you. What if you did that? What what would change in your church? How would your church be different? Realizing that your church is you. It's you and it's me and it's all of us together. What if you opened up your heart to receive love from others in your church? Wow. How would your life change? How would their lives change if we actually just cracked the door of our heart a little bit and let someone in? Sometimes that means you got to go and be part of a hope and life group or something so that you have a, another setting where, where we have gathered just for that purpose and we're talking and praying for one another. If you're ashamed of yourself, you can't come out of the shadows by yourself. 
But if you can rest in God's approval, his acceptance, and his love, you can start to engage and connect with others in the church. If you're driven and ambitious, that's good. God God put that in your life. But you, you get to overcome your tendency to ignore or even run over other people sometimes. That's what you're called to do in the kingdom of God as you embrace the Jesus who embraces us. If, you, if you're overwhelmed, you will find peace in the midst of the worshiping church. I had an experience this past week. I, 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 church, I, I just don't even know how to describe how busy Pastor Shelley and I have been for these past six months. Really, it started before then, but in, in June, when construction started, I, I knew it was going to be busier, but I didn't know it was going to be this busy. It's been hard. It's been very hard. I, I personally feel like I've been working two jobs, two full-time jobs. That, that's how I felt. All of my sermon prep has been after hours, all of it, because I'm so busy during the day. And this past week, uh, we had, I was invited to a, a gathering of, of Assemblies of God pastors. It, it's uh, just a little sectional meeting, an area meeting of about 50, 50 60 people, uh, pastors and missionaries. And I just thought, oh my goodness, I cannot go to this. I'm so overwhelmed. I, I, have, I feel like I have four million things I need to do. I have so many people who are asking me questions. Every, everyone wants a piece of me. But I've been to enough of these, I thought, I have to go. I went, and I knew there would be a time of worship. And in the midst of my craziness, I just took some time at 1 p.m. Tuesday afternoon to just worship the Lord. Tears are streaming down my cheek. I was just in God's presence and with people around me. While we're just standing there worshiping, a missionary that, uh, uh, that we support came over and he just laid his hands on me, gave me a big old hug, and just started praying for me. That is the church. And that's what we crave for you every time you gather. So listen, if you're stressed, overwhelmed, or whatever's going on in your life, and part of you thinks, oh, I'll just stay home and not go gather with the church or not be a part of a group or whatever. I just want to encourage you, come and get yourself in the midst of a bunch of people worshiping you. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, ear, earbuds when we're, we're in the worship band. We have earbuds in our ears. We're, we're, we're hearing each other and just hearing all, all this kind of stuff. And I loved it when I could hear way louder over my, uh, my earbuds, the music in my earbuds this morning when we were worshiping. And the whole church was saying, all my life you have been faithful. Oh, wow. Did you, did you experience that too? Like way louder than all the music in my ears was the church singing to God, oh, you've been faithful. That's the church. And there's something refreshing and loving when you gather with the church. If you've been hurt, by someone in the church, or maybe you've labeled that that you were hurt by the church. The church is you, so guess what? You're in that group. (laughs) If you've been hurt, though, or if you've hurt others in the church, I just want to say, come to Jesus. He is the healer of broken hearts. Let's not stay bitter and hurting and grieving. Let's, Let's come to the healer get restoration and healing, and move on. This is the church that you're invited to be a part of. And God intends for you to experience the love you want through this crazy amalgamation of diverse and different people, his loving fellowship of difference with a T. So what's keeping you? What's keeping you away from that? Would you stand to your feet? Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? And online, make this a, a time of prayer too. Let's, let's get together. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, first of all, I just want to thank you for your love and your grace and your tenderhearted mercy and your kindness, humility, and patience towards me. 
and towards us, Lord. Thank you, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The church is thanking you now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the love that you have wrapped us up in. Your love. Thank you, Lord. We have experienced that. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to clothe ourselves in that kind of love. The kind of love that thinks of others first, that crosses social boundaries to just go and love somebody in the church. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us to extend that kind of love. And Lord, I also pray, this is just as important, help us to open up our hearts to receive that kind of love, that tender heart of mercy from one another. Lord Jesus, we look around and we see Jesus with skin on because you're in your people and you're working through us. And for some reason, I just feel drawn to linger on this moment of prayer right here. Lord, help us to open up our hearts to somebody or to somebody's to receive love. Lord, I just pray that part of the clothing ourselves with love and with these things would happen as Jesus with skin on comes and gives us a hug or prays for us. Lord, help us to be open. Help us not, not to be the type of people that just run out the door the second the service is over. Help us to give and receive love. Help us to clothe ourselves in love. And in so doing, find your renewed life. Renew us, Lord. Renew us. Renew our hearts. Renew our minds. Renew our lives. In, let's stay in this, this atmosphere of prayer. And I just want to invite you, if you have it already, invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. He's the answer. He, fact, he's the only thing that matters. You might think, I can't do that. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. All that matters is Christ and him living inside of you. It does not matter where you've been. What matters is where you're going and who you're going with, Jesus. So I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, to become a Christian today. How do you do that? Turn from your sins. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. If you want to do that today, if you want to become a Christian today, to put your faith in Jesus today, maybe you're coming back to him, maybe this is the first time, would you just raise your hand right now? And that's just a, a, a hand saying, pray for me, Pastor, because yes, I want to put my faith in Jesus today. I, I want to know I'm a Christian following him. And online, you can raise your hand to God too. So Lord, you see our hands, you know our hearts, Lord God. Uh, all of us who are raising our hands, we just so want to experience your love and your grace, your mercy, your tender-hearted uh, mercy, Lord, your compassion. Lord, some of us right now, we, 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 we know we've done bad. We know we've walked away from you. We know that we, we've tried this and done that and experimented with that other thing. We know that. We know the people we've hurt. We know all that, Lord. But despite all that, we come to you today for your grace, mercy, and love, your patience and your humility towards us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So if you're putting your faith in Jesus today, would you just repeat after me this prayer? Pray it to Jesus. Church, help him out. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you just did that, welcome to the kingdom of God. That is just the first of many steps following Jesus. We're going to tell you a little bit more about some next steps. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Yes, so um, if today was your day, or if you're just a newer b um, believer in Jesus and you want to know, how do I follow Jesus? Like, what, what do I do? We have a great resource for you. It's called the Following Jesus Book and Course. You can stop by. The, there's a little table in the lobby. I'll be there handing those out. They are, everything is free. The book is free. The course is free. It's our gift for you. It's just a, 
a springboard for you to start learning how do I follow Jesus. So I encourage you, please stop by, please talk to me, um, and we'll, we'll get you set up with that. And then if you filled out those Connect cards, please put them in the offering box on your way out. And I think that's it. So we'll see you next week in person or online. God bless.